Hey, Jim, how's it going? Good to, good to chat with you again. Good to talk with you, Ted. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I know we've talked a lot off air, but I wanted to record a video because I know there's a lot of people that have wanted to hear from you and hear what you've been up to. I know uh, personally you're less involved with the cannabis scene as you used to be, and you've been getting more into mushrooms, but do you want to just kind of fill people in on what, what's been going on in your life? Sure. I Thank you uh, for asking. I had, uh, we were able to pay off our house a few months ago. And uh, I don't know, I just decided to remodel. And I got rid of, we've been here 17 years and got rid of 17 years of junk. It's just amazing. I, I went through 17 years of computer equipment. <laughs> like, why did I buy this? You know, so it's been kind of a, a, a semi approach to minimalism, I guess you'd say. And, um, and I really got uh, really, really tired of being involved on any level at the cannabis scene. So I uh, contract my growing to somebody that I trust outdoors. And uh, I get extremely nice yield of high quality flowers and let everybody go have a good time. And uh, just for needing some recreation, I guess you'd say, and I really enjoy growing things, still do. Um, I got involved in growing mushrooms and uh, working with a fellow that you would know, I think, is Set It and Forget It Organics on Instagram. And uh, so we worked through some different recipes and for the substrate. And actually, it's interesting, uh, one of the books that I used was uh, Organic Mushroom Farming and Soil Remediation by a gentleman from North Carolina. And it was the first how-to book that actually mentioned things like, you know, earthworm castings, uh, rock dust. So I kind of felt a kindred, hey, I'm back home. You know, that's pretty cool. And uh, so, yeah, it's been really fun and, and growing your own food. And as well as the medicine on the uh, lion mane and uh, uh, what you would know as maitake, some in the Northwest refer to it as hen of the woods. Uh, but there's several uh, turkey tail and other mushrooms that uh, we can grow that have long established uh, histories as, in terms of uh, medicinal, out of, primarily out of uh, Asia, China and uh, Japan. And then, of course, the the food, the culinary mushrooms are really exciting. You can grow uh, oysters, uh, which are the easiest mushroom in the world to grow. And that one I would recommend people start with so they don't get some stumbling blocks. I mean, I wouldn't start out with growing lion's mane, for example. I'd probably do mushrooms and then kind of work up. And especially for the outdoor gardens, we can use uh, wine caps. And so not only are we growing food, but it's also doing some wonderful things with the soil and deconstructing uh, the carbon sources that are in the soil. Maybe like a lot, for example, well, you know this better than I do, you create soils. Uh, a lot of potty soils have a lot of wood in it, wood chips. So by using uh, mycelium, we can deconstruct that and it just adds to the humus of the soil, you know, the, the nutrient profile. So it's a win-win. You're not only improving the soil, but we're also growing viable food, good source of uh, B vitamins and protein, what have you. Now, a couple things, a couple questions I had, because I am not a mushroom expert. I, I love eating mushrooms. I loved the interview with Paul Stamets that on the Joe Rogan podcast, that was sort of what uh -huh. some of this stuff around like lion's mane, creating new neurological connections in your brain and, and some right. of ways that people are using fungi, which is incredible. And uh, I've always had been a little bit of, I think there's a term for it and I might have it wrong, but I think it's mycophobic. Yes. Mycophobia. Yep. The sure sense is. of like going out, my brother, for example, will go out and harvest wild mushrooms. And that makes me really nervous, not knowing what I'm going to be consuming, just because of the dangers associated with them and learning how to do spore prints and things like that. So right. 
I, um, I've always heard that you need to be, have very sterile conditions to grow mushrooms and you need, um, you need to be very careful and it's, it can be you know, somewhat dangerous because some of these mushrooms are toxic. So mm -hmm. it's almost like there's this fear based thing around mushrooms that uh, is sort of more of the, the public opinion that, that doesn't sound like is really accurate. No. And, and, uh, culturally that phobia or whatever we want to call it goes back millennia. I mean, this isn't something new. Um, what I suggest people consider is that for example, Paul Stamets up at uh, fungi.com, he sells a spawn. So the, 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 Part of the process that requires the sterilization and almost lab conditions, we'll say. He's already done it. I suspect they sent you a link this morning in preparation for this for several varieties of mushrooms that you could buy with confidence. And the spawn is, is already, it's already uh, colonized with the correct, uh, whether it be oysters or whatever. I think he's got shiitake and probably whatever. And there's other, there's other sources too. So. For people that are concerned, I, w I mean, I'm not going to go walk around the Pacific Northwest and go, well, I think that's a, I mean, take a class. You know, there's the American Mycology uh, Association that has branches and state organizations. I know there's one or two in Washington. You know, uh, it's kind of fun. You get out uh, with a group of people and an expert. And, uh, you know, it's if you're going to do that, I would suggest taking a class and do a lot of reading with books that have and try to get the digital version. So it's on your iPhone or something. <laughs> so you can do some uh, identification. Now, some of them you're not, I mean, obviously you're not going to confuse a lion's mane with a toadstool. Sure. Uh, uh, and some of the uh, other ones that we find growing on the timber itself, like uh, uh, Rishi. But, uh, and those you buy the plugs, they're already inoculated and you drill a hole and you insert the plug and away you go. So that's probably the path of uh, alleviating some of those concerns. But I, I, I'm with you uh, when people send me pictures, hey, look, what do you think this is? How do we want to offer an opinion? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be cooking and eating it. Uh, Unless, you know, that your drunken brother-in-law is coming over or something, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> so always, know, start, always start with a positive identification. That sounds like absolutely. a that's, I mean, that's, disclaimer to throw out there to people. Ab absolutely. And, and, and barring that, until you feel comfortable, then I would buy spawn. Uh, inoculated or colonized, excuse me, colonized uh, medium. More often than not, wood chips. And, uh, but I know, for example... Uh, Doug at uh, Northwest Redworms, he used to grow uh, oysters, the white oysters, the standard one, I guess you'd say, in these uh, plastic bags that you hang from the rafters. So I just got pretty excited. I said, well, what'd you use as a medium? Oh, newspaper and coffee grounds. I said, excuse me? Uh, I know that I saw a video I have to I'll find it for you, but the guy grew it on old tennis shoes. I remember this is really an important thing. I think in this whole discussion, fungi was here before plants, which preceded the animal kingdom, and they're going to be around long after the insects are gone. Uh, I think the role of uh, that. Uh, one of the most important books a person could read, I think, is, I think you read, you have a copy of this, is Mycelium Running yeah. by Paul Stamets. And I think that's, that should be like uh, the primer for anybody to get a, a, a grasp of how much uh, fungi, the role it plays in our world. Sure. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're primary decomposers. So when you say an old shoe or coffee grounds, um, they're going to be one of the things that's really efficient at breaking down carbon. Oh, uh, absolutely. Now, it, go ahead. Well, no, I, uh, for example, the, a popular one 
would be straw. Okay, so you got a good source of lignin and carbon, what have you. I started thinking it through that I said, you know, like, well, wait a minute, what are they doing in Asia? So I look, and rice hulls. Well, for me, it's a lot easier messing around with rice hulls and getting a bale of whatever, you know, because I can just run up to concentrates and get uh, the stamp like you buy, you know, uh, uh, what is it? I don't know if they sell it by the pound or 50 pounds or it's by cubic feet, but it's a lot of rice hulls for, you know, under 20 bucks, I can you know, tell you that. And so that's really inexpensive. And uh, I don't have to mess around with uh, straw, you know, trying to bust up a bale. Though I have uh, done some work with another gentleman and we used bales of straw that we picked up from a uh, feed store and put some of the colonized spawn use that to uh then inoculate the straw and uh yeah it's not so so you're working with colonized spawn um but i know essentially what you're saying is you don't need sterile media to grow that spawn out based on right the, you've actually done. what you want is okay the way that uh that I was taught and uh, we use pasteurized substrate, not uh, sterilized. And we're gonna go back to your expertise in history with uh, dealing with microbes in a soil, in a, a soil mix. So we don't want a completely sterile medium because nature abhors a vacuum, right? So you're going to get contaminants. Whereas if you pasteurize it, you're still leaving, and I really dislike using this phrase, but this is a popular one. You leave the good guys there, the good microbes there in the pasteurization, which just simply means you're soaking the material in water between 160 and 180 Fahrenheit for a period of, uh, well, I'll go with an hour, hour and 15 minutes and that is going to give you a clean substrate but it's not going to be sterile and so especially if you're growing uh the most popular because it's the easiest one to grow the most widely grown are the oyster in a good way they're very invasive so once it hits that uh, substrate they take over and that's a good thing so uh just like you know, we do with our compost teas, you want to put add the correct uh, aerobic microbial colonies, which will keep the anaerobic colonies at bay or destroy them, what have you. So it's, we're, it's still the same uh, science that that isn't different. And that makes it because you can go to Amazon right now and for under $20, get a cardboard box with a oyster mushroom start in it. And you open the box up and set it and you get to watch it grow over the next several days. So that's, uh, I think is really cool because it gives people caught. Well, I could do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're manufacturing this in you know, wherever and shipping around the country, I mean, they're getting repeat business. So obviously it's not, uh, some big, you know, feat to grow it. And that would get, then give the person confidence to buy the, colonized spawn from Paul Stamets and others uh, some for that you want to maybe grow in a I don't know, like a plastic tub but other varieties you'd want to put out in your garden like the uh, wine caps those the, the wine cap is actually one of their nicknames is soil buster so if you have really hard soils you know you know what I'm talking about rather than get out the El Toro Rototiller. Uh, yeah, we can use this, and it uh, plus it's then going to give you crumb, which you know more about that than I do. The importance of crumb, the Lukey uh, methods, uh, control uh, microbiology in our uh, soils, and it's just fun, you know. Especially, it's a really good learning. I've been working with people adding uh, spawn to their worm bins. So we're gonna raise the fungal level in the vermicompost. And while we're doing that, we're gonna be able to harvest some food. 
And How are you doing that if you're not pasteurizing the worm bin? Because that would kill the worms. Well, because worm uh, vermicompost in the very nature uh, and its <clears throat> ecosystem is very, uh, uh, that, I wouldn't want to use the word antiseptic, but it's a very clean medium. We adulterate it, okay? And I'm not suggesting that we want to grow in straight worm castings, I'm not. Uh, but that's a very, very pure uh, medium to start with. And so if a person just took really quality vermicompost, and I've done this myself and mixed it about one part compost to three parts uh, of vermicompost with uh, three parts of uh, rice hulls, which I did uh, uh, pasteurize, not sterilize, and then added just some kelp. And you're gonna get tired of hearing this, but kelp, neem, uh, kelp, neem, uh, and malted barley to okay. the substrate. Because uh, the malt, fungi are enzyme engines, and we already have uh, several hundred year history of using those very enzymes created by barley in bread baking. It's what they call diastatic malt. It's added to the dough to increase the activity of the yeast. Well, what's yeast? Well, yeast is a single cell fungi. So uh, I decided, huh, I wonder if this will do anything for the ones I was trying to grow, and it sure did. I went, wow, this is really cool. So here's a product for 80 cents a pound that you, I added to a substrate recipe. And Set It and Forget It Organics, uh, he's been doing a lot of work with, uh, on substrate recipes and trying to use things that are, would be easy for people to locate like, uh, core even, mm -hmm. coconut core, uh, or sphagnum peat moss or things like that. But uh, we're trying to use every day, not trying to make it some exotic, because it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, it, it, trying to keep it easy yeah. for people to understand. And uh, I don't want, you know, there's, there's some good books out there. And one is uh, not exactly the most exciting name, but it's called mushroom cultivation. <laughs> and it's strictly about outdoor uh, gardens, adding different varieties of uh, edible mushrooms that we can use and not only to improve the tilth in our garden plots, but also provide us with a good viable protein source. So for vegetarians and even uh, vegans, this is a good alternative for a uh, meat-free dieter and people like yourself just yeah i like the taste of them so uh yeah i i actually what sparked this because i knew you were doing this journey in doing these experiments with various mushrooms and things like that uh i went over to my mother's house out in port ludlow and she had gone to the local farmer's market and picked up some fresh oyster mm -hmm. mushrooms and they were phenomenal i mean oh, yeah. the flavor on them it was a little bit of a meaty flavor almost Right. Kind of a little bit like chicken, but different. I don't want people to think. <laughs> think yeah, 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 yeah. Everything's like chicken, yeah. But it was but, yeah, so no. <laughs> good and so much healthier, you know, to yes. be eating this. That uh, other than the price, because they were expensive. Uh, oh yeah. They were they were great. So it made me think about ways I could start growing these at home and and learning more about it because I really I really did enjoy it. Yeah. The uh, one one way is. Uh, to use, go over to uh, Home Depot or whatever place like that, Walmart, I suppose. And the uh, tubs, that, the storage tubs, the, uh, the like Rubbermaid, that kind of thing. You could use those even. And uh, if it didn't pan out, then, uh, you know, you'd still have a storage tub or, you know, mixed soil or whatever, you know, something like that. But uh, yeah, it just you put uh, substrate in there. Find a recipe that you're comfortable with that makes sense to you. And uh, I can't. It's hard for me to envision how anybody could really fail with uh, something like uh, the oyster mushrooms. They're just that easy to grow. Okay. 
it started a hundred years ago at the, after uh, during World War One in Germany, and out of necessity feed the people, and then after in the twenties and thirties it spread like wildfire throughout Asia, so that it became a it's a major crop in China and and India, because you can produce a lot of protein and you don't have to, it's not like trying to grow an exotic plant, like say uh, orchids. You're not going to break the bank. We're talking about, you know, growing mushrooms. This is really like a poor man's uh, hobby, which appealed to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I spent enough uh, time and effort and money on uh, growing, learning, I thinking I did uh, to grow cannabis, you know, or something. Yeah. So uh, this is really, uh, and it's almost instant. I mean, you get you see the results of your work in a couple of weeks. Okay, it's so yeah. Like, you know. So let's say I wanted to try going oyster mushrooms. Okay. I know you've talked a little bit about this process already. You said they're the easiest. So take me through all the steps from beginning to end. You know, like going to the website, ordering the spawn. Right. What should I have at home before the spawn arrives? Well, you want to have your substrate ready. And uh, the beauty is that commercially, some of the things that are used to grow oysters are really intriguing. Like I said, you know, uh, my good friend uh, Doug over at Northwest, he was using uh, uh, newsprint and uh, coffee grounds. Yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> and not only that, not, and not just getting one crop in one cycle. You get what they call uh, – anyway. Is there like a, a pH range though? So here's here's the thing. When you say coffee grounds and, and newsprint, I think that's not going to a very uh, nutrient-rich source for these mushrooms, which makes me wonder if these mushrooms might be a little less nutritious than if I had grown them in a, in a you know, higher – higher nutritive that's a really really good question and one that i can't give you uh, a specific answer to but i have wondered the same thing so one of the reasons i bought the book uh organic mushroom farming is that that issue is addressed to some degree by instead okay you remember when you first showed up at uh or we did, I mean, about the same time, over at IC Mag. Yeah. I remember how much bad information there was? Okay. Sure. Oh, well, imagine that you'd been there 10 years earlier, okay, about how bad it could have been. Well, that's where the mushroom forms are now. I mean, it's appalling. I mean, I read things like, well, yeah, you want to add uh, limestone because you need all those minerals. Let's see, we got calcium carbonate. What what exact nutrients are we talking? I mean, if I want nutrients, I'll use basalt. Okay, yeah, something besides just calcium. Yeah, you know, I mean, and kelp meal. Yeah. Probably the richest uh, plant on the earth. So I have a kelp story to tell you, but uh, just just to simplify things. So basically, you're you're saying uh, for a substrate that that's what you have to have ready, and then you're recommending starting with something. I think you mentioned rice hulls, or yes, that's your carbon source. Or yeah, that's your carbon. Or I mean, you can use straw. That's more traditional. Straw. It's okay. probably cheaper. Um, but I live in you know the city. And I got to drive 15 miles to a feed store. And then God knows how, you know, the whole drill, at least with the, uh, the rice holes that I get from concentrates are organic. So cross your fingers, you know. Uh, with rice holes, I worry about uh, arsenic levels potentially being an issue. Uh, right. From a heavy metal right. perspective. Right. But let's, let's just talk organic straw for So let me try and find a source of organic straw. You would mm -hmm. sit it in a tub. You would, you would, heat the water to between 100 mm -hmm. and 108 degrees and keep it there for you said at least an hour and 15 hours right, right. Uh, to make sure that we have pasteurized it yes and then what happens then do you need to get the spawn on it right away what um, you well what you, you do, you're gonna uh you want to drain and squeeze out 
is much like, remember, fungi are, for many, many decades, it was taught at universities that fungi were a subset of the plant kingdom. And we now know that's ridiculous. Yeah. They're closer to animals in this regard. They use oxygen and expel CO2. So you want that substrate like our soils in this regard. You want it moist, but you don't want it drenched. And okay. uh, so uh, what I do is I just get, uh, I got some 100% cotton uh, pillowcases, put the substrate in there and just squeeze it and, you know, keep twisting it and twisting, get as much water and then let it hang maybe for a day. It's not, no, it's not like, okay, we got to rush. I mean, you want to be, take caution, of course. And then uh, when you'll know the consistency, you want it so that it's, what's that word we use? And so loamy. Okay. That's what you're looking for. So air passages. Yeah. And then you dump in your uh, spawn, which in the case of uh, oysters, they're probably, I'm, I'm not sure what Mr. Stamets is using, but let's say it's chips, wood chips or shavings or what have you. Um, I found it easier in my experiments to use organic sorghum or milo whatever term and uh it, it's really inexpensive because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a feedstock you probably feed it to your chickens or it's part of the, the mix uh, of your uh, chicken um, mash or whatever it's called and um, because uh sorghum has a shell like corn popcorn if you will um we have found that to be easy to inoculate and colonize. But yeah, I mean, you're kind of wide open, whatever. So you're mixing that in with the straw? Yeah. And then you're adding neem and kelp and rock dust mm -hmm. to yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I just you sprinkle it in just a little bit, light dust? Um, about like what I did with the uh, soil, you like say a cup of uh, neem to a cubic foot. Okay. Uh, a cup of kelp. Now there's a funny, that's an interesting one. In uh, studies that I downloaded from India using neem and karanja, not only did it suppress the contaminants, as the term is used, it increased the yield uh, factor on the fruit that they were actually wanting to grow. In this case, it was oysters. And which sounds, well, if it's a fungicide, yeah, but it's not a, you know, I don't want to get into that whole thing because uh, it's, it's one of the silliest conversations in the cannabis scene. But uh, so just out of uh, a why not, I started adding kelp, or excuse me, uh, neem meal to the uh, recipe, the substrate. And I saw the same thing, a suppression of contaminants and an increase in the yield of the the target uh, fruit that we were trying to see. Now, one nice thing about oysters is they they have a very distinctive look, so you can feel pretty confident. Absolutely. That you're not getting something some contaminant in there. Well, uh, the contaminants are usually that's kind of like soil. Remember, we used to talk about uh, on the cannabis boards that if you see the term was mold, I think. Uh, if it's this color, you're fine. If it's that color, you're not so fine. And so blues and greens, you don't want to see. White is, you know, we're, we're dancing, right? <laughs> well, it's the same thing in the substrate. If, you know, you start seeing green, you know, just call it a day and toss it. Oh, you're uh, talking about molds, not actual fruiting mushroom caps. You're saying if you see mold growing in the so. Yeah, it's, it all has to do with color. You're gonna you're gonna see white, which is what you want. Okay, but it's like just like in our soils, we didn't want to see what pinks, blues, and greens. If my memory serves me correct, I only ever saw white, so I never concerned myself. Yeah, do you uh, have to poke holes in the uh, pillowcase, or will it actually grow right through the cotton? Oh no, I just meant I use that to. Uh, get as much water out of the substrate as possible. Oh, so you're growing it in, you, you then put it into a tub. Yes. 
okay. then I, you you drill some two inch holes for ventilation, and you use that tape that if uh, they use on bandages, uh, it, it you can see through it, but it's it has little like microscopic type holes in it. Use that to cover and that that uh, blocks uh, contaminants getting into your tub. Okay. Huh. They say I mean you buy it at you know any by uh where you get your prescriptions you know drugstore it's just that uh, that tape you use to wrap around uh, your bandage how's that you want your bandage to breathe right like so athletic this, tape or first aid tape yeah it's that first aid yes uh, yeah it's not not the heavy duty stuff just uh it's i don't know three dollars for i don't know 300 feet or something or okay so anyway you drill these two inch holes and that again we're back to fungi you need oxygen so you need good ventilation, but you don't want, you want to have a way to block the bad guys from getting in there. Yeah, do you need it, to put a fan or anything on this? No, no. I mean, I've had some other interesting ideas going into an aquarium store and looking at some of the stuff they use to create air bubbles. Yeah. Those long, uh, skinny. I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, if you build a frame out of those, put that on the bottom with an air hook. I mean, I, it's, this is open to a lot of investigation and the beauty is that it's not gonna break the bank. It's not like, well, let me try this thousand dollar super duper light from, you know, we be growing weed or something. And if I, well, no, it didn't work. It didn't, you know, it didn't pay off. I mean, this is like a poor man's uh, hobby, or I guess you could say. So how long from the time you inoculate the spore into the straw and you get it into the tub, how long until we'll start seeing mushrooms? With the uh, oysters, because of how, and I mean this in a positive way, how invasive they are, 10 to 12 days. And then it's just like, you know, you're cutting constantly and getting, I mean, this thing goes on for several weeks. That's why, so the, uh, you don't want to grow cannabis. You know, you're looking at three months before, well, how did, you know, how did it pan out? How did those seeds work, right? Well, you don't have that here. I mean, this is like instant gratification almost, or as close as you can get to instant gratification. Yeah. So that's, and the other thing is with the oysters, uh, sometime when you're bored, look at the variety. There's like 22 major varieties, and some of them are just, I mean, they're pieces of art. You could hire a professional photographer and shoot them and sell postcards of it. I mean, huh. some of the exotic blues and pinks and all kinds of neat colors. Uh, there's something like I've, I've, I believe I'm quoting Paul Stamets so I, I want to be careful here I don't want to misquote him but yeah. something like uh, 15,000 specific varieties of uh, fungi around, that are cultivated either by intent or you know what have you huh. and the, the amount that fruit is fairly limited. I mean, for example, uh, morels. Everybody likes morels, right? That's actually the fruit of uh, ectomycorrhizal. That's why we get them at the base of trees. That's the yeah. fruit from that uh, variety of uh, fungi. I just found that really fascinating. Hmm. And some grow in decomposing logs on the ground some grow on living trees like reishi uh you that's where you ha find those uh and when you buy like say logs uh that are already pre-inoculated uh, the big one is uh uh the ones from japan uh um shiitake yeah so you you get this log it's a uh, for this discussion we'll call it uh sawdust held together, bound by a, a resin of some type that's been uh, inoculated with the spores. And so it's a one-time use. But uh, that's an easy way to get started too, just for the gratification part of it. You order, and they're not expensive, so you order a log and you grow some mushrooms or, uh, and it just gives you a sense of accomplishment. Well, I did this, you know, so that then leads you to some that maybe are a little bit more challenging. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to start with here. 
Um, there's a local guy who makes them. He makes a few different products, and so I, I know I can get the logs from him. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're up there. That's why Paul Stamets is domiciled up there. I mean, the Pacific Northwest is one of the epicenters of, uh, well, let's use the word uh, mushroom foraging. How's that? There's just a lot of opportunities. Uh, many were native and some were brought in, you know, just the sort of the human race moving around and things. But uh, yeah, that would be, if you know somebody that's putting together the shiitake logs, Mm -hmm. That would be way cool just to have it in your store. Yeah. When people come in and go, look what I did, you know, kind of thing. And, so, uh, yeah, we had one actually set up and, uh, this is funny. So one night our security alarm started going off and we couldn't figure out what it was. The whole thing was covered and there was movement inside our, uh, farm store. Turns out, uh, what had caused it was, uh, one of the mushroom logs had released spores and it oh. like poofed and then these spores had hit the camera wow it that's caused cool. the alert to go off so we went down there was no one there but uh we figured out after the fact that we would put the mushroom log too close to the camera yeah i mean there's <laughs> i've seen some videos of uh time lapse yes of, of, it's the most fascinating it's the most fascinating thing that I've ever been involved in is uh, just this learning uh, about, especially for myself, was medicinal mushrooms, the uh, the cordyceps and the lion's mane. Ooh, actually, though, the lion's mane, oh, there's one for you. If you get, and you can find them here in the Northwest because this is foodie central, right? Yeah. Seattle and Portland. So you get to take fresh... Uh, lion's mane you cut them into steaks and then you treat it like lobster or crab and that's what it tastes like just you know uh, spread some butter on it with some herbs and then grill it i mean what a great what a great uh, you say uh, you and your wife are having a dinner party you want to impress people well here's a non-meat meal that i prepared for you uh and you could do some things with uh well my taki uh wood ear oysters i mean you could really create some really wonderful uh now where i come in is i'm a real big bread baker yeah so i like making artisan pizza doughs and then using uh mushrooms on that not with a ton of cheese either the you know you want the flavors to come through of these wonderful uh, uh things that we grew in our gardens yeah. but i could see like at your farm having like an exhibit area for the children to yeah. see uh, mushrooms growing and how they're harvested and then might even turn it into a profit center. You know, you can have come pick a mushroom or something. You know? Well, yeah, we've tried inoculating some logs, but we didn't have anyone that was really staying with it and making sure right. it was successful. Right. I think that's important with any living organism. So I, I'm hoping to try again once we get the farm, you know, Running. Well, you're right. You're right around the corner from Paul and uh, his operation. So, yeah, you know, picking up the uh, I don't know if he has will call or whatever, but even shipping, you're going to have it there the next day. And he's uh, and his staff are really good about answering questions. And uh, I mean, man, when you go into the substrate business, you know, I got a couple of guys that uh, would be interested in talking to you, you know. Uh, yeah, my uh, my wife and I have been taking the Lion's Mane and a few of the other products mm -hmm. from Paul Stamets' company. Um, they've been they've been great. It feels good to take something that's healthy and safe. Yes, yes. Uh, I know, use it. I, I, I buy a different product, but uh, he uh, he worked for uh, Paul Stamets as an extractor for over a year, and then uh, set up his own business down in Ashland. Yeah, in Southern Oregon. And uh, he's got one uh, product. All his products are $50 a pound. And so your prescription or the dosage is four grams a day. So that's 110 days worth a mm -hmm. pound. I mean, for $50? It's cheaper than supplements. And uh, yeah, Paul's, Paul's stuff is expensive, but fortunately we have a wholesale account because sure. 
we're, we're a retail establishment. So we, uh, a lot of the staff and stuff will get an employee discount and is able to. Sure. The, the one he, uh, the, the gentleman, I can't remember his name, but anyway, uh, he has one that's uh, 10 varieties hmm. and they're different, uh, primarily, uh, I don't know, really, shouldn't have said that, but a lot are from China and have been used in uh, traditional Chinese medicine for centuries. Grown here, just originally, originally. Yes, kind of. right. I want to make and that as, clear for people. <laughs> oh yeah, right, exactly. Well, uh, like I was telling you yesterday, a friend of mine, his uh, wife is, uh, is Chinese and they have a little boy and they're in China right now visiting grandpa and the aunts and uncles and what have you. So one of his uh, wife's uh, uncles is owns a well an herb uh, traditional medicine store thing apothecary. Type there medicine. you go, apothecary. Right, like you in Chinatown that you'd see in Portland or Seattle. So I gave him a list of all the Chinese names. I said, see if you can get these uh, dried, and then uh, we can do. I'm, this isn't as complicated as I'm making it sound, but we can do a Jurassic Park thing <laughs> and uh, get that those uh, those spores reactivated so that we can uh, produce them and grow them, yeah. But like some of the ones that are really beautiful mushrooms, like turkey tail, that's a big uh, medicinal one, and uh, cordyceps, which is the most fascinating of, of all of them, I think. Uh, that's the one that will actually eat insects. That's correct. Right? Or, or, or the, it's the zombie fungus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is because it will cause them to act. It actually affects their neural function. That's correct. With ants and stuff. It's that's really fascinating. Yeah, and uh, yeah, when you get into the world, it's like what's really cool about it is that it hasn't been bastardized yet, and I don't know that it can because mycology is a is a really big universe to go play in. And there just aren't that many Paul Stamets around. That's the reality of it. Yeah. Uh, or, or people who can explain the big picture as well as he does. And um, so you're not gonna see Well, you're never gonna see a Canacon for mycologist, okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're not gonna have, uh, there's an old a song from like almost 55 years ago from the Rolling Stone. And the title of it, you know, is all you need to hear is, uh, it's the West Coast Under Assist, the Under Assistant West Coast Promotion Man. And that's when I was looking at the, an upcoming event in Portland in August, like who is gonna be there? And that's the first thing I thought of was that, song by the rolling you know button down uh you know selling the dream but i don't think that that is ever really gonna at least uh in well my lifetime maybe in your lifetime i don't think you're gonna see that happening it would be it would be it would really blow my mind if it did that you would see that the whole thing would get turned on its head yeah yeah well, who but, knows? I mean, cannabis sure has changed in your lifetime quite dramatically. You know, what's really funny is that I was thinking about this the other day in a conversation with a friend. We go back to when Lyndon Johnson was president, okay, as far as our friendship. So we were there before it started. I mean, on the, this level, or, you know, just that many people lighting up or whatever, you know, we're supposed to say getting stoned. Um, and so, I, you know, we lived through the whole thing and watched it morph into what it, whatever it is, you know, now. And it just boggles my mind that in one year prices could drop 80%. Yeah. I just, I mean, there used to be a time where you could grow some pounds, you know, you shuffle them off for, 3,200 and you know, it was a nice little adjunct to your income, I suppose. Um, but not probably as many as you have. I've been to a few uh, 
rec farms, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And my first thought was, man, you guys are in trouble. That's a lot of plants. It I mean, what, what are you thinking? You know, I mean, I wouldn't want to grow 4,000 tomato plants without a big crew. And I don't know. Scaling is a definite, is a definite challenge that uh, we deal with. Uh, I still like dealing with people that, uh, you know, still in the, it's in the sunshine and I'm just an old curmudgeon. I don't buy into this garbage about, uh, no, indoors is the best taste. No, that isn't. But, you know, you, you're just afraid of being high, you know. Uh, when I started, when I started, when I started on this journey, my first crop went in the ground 43 years ago. And the word sensimia hadn't even been popularized yet. So we didn't know what we were doing. Just, you know, uh, go out and chop down some weed, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were going to seed straight out of Thailand and India and Sri Lanka, what have you. And then it started in the late 70s, early 80s. The name game started out of California, of course. Uh, all these wacky names. And then uh, in the late 80s, when the two uh, first of the two major seed companies, today what you would know as uh, Sensi Seeds was, uh, they had a catalog called the SSSC, Super Sativa Seed Club. And in their listings, they gave credit to several seeds that came out of the Northwest from a group called Sacred Seeds. There's a reason that Williams Wonder, well, look on a map, and Williams, Oregon, and Wonder, Oregon, on the opposite side of a valley down in Southern Oregon. Uh, the main one of their, what do you call it? I guess the forerunner of many of their strains is the Afghani hashtag one, number one, Afghani number one. Well, that was one, and they, this is, they're giving them credit in their catalog, so obviously it's true. They bought that from Sacred Seeds. And then the other big catalog was, uh, I can't think of his name, but anyway, the Seed Bank, and he hooked up with uh, Sam the Skunk Man, so that's where you got the haze, and Northern Lights came out of uh, British Columbia, the BCGA, British Columbia Growers Association, and that whole thing. But that's when I saw it changing. Uh, we don't want all those imports, man. We can, you know, we'll make it better because I know this guy that's got this really cool, you know, fill in the blank, and I can cross it with my fill in the blank. And then the seed thing was on. I never imagined that it would get the insanity that a, Mayton, a Peyton Manning Kush, I mean, really? <laughs> Obama Kush. I mean, come on. And uh, I'm looking at a, a book right now that one of the authors is uh, Victoria Hayes. I'd like to see the uh, birth certificate on that before I buy into that one. Hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, the whole, uh, I don't know, uh, grabbing people's genetics and you know, going to copyright them or whatever that scam is. I, you know, somebody actually, I had about four people tell me, well, you know, they got some of your genetics. And I said, yes, yeah, so what? Who cares? I don't care. You know, it doesn't mean anything. It'll get bastardized with the first person that buys it because, you know, I got this guy, you know, he's got this, you know, special cush from, you know, wherever. Uh, but Pimple, Texas, man, you know, we're going to cross that and make a super strain. So I'm still waiting for that super strain, but you know, so far I retired from the business and said, yeah, okay. I it didn't happen. I've been waiting for 40 years, but I haven't seen it yet. I still don't, I don't believe that American breeders for an, and not a criticism, just a statement of fact will ever hit the levels of several hundred years of, hand selected seeds from places like Sri Lanka and Thailand and other places. That's all. 
we don't have that sense of uh, longevity or in terms of uh, seeing the big picture. It's all about immediate results, you know. Okay, here's an example. One of the biggest uh, developers of uh, dahlias is here in Oregon, the dahlia farm down near uh, a few miles south of me. And I go to their show every year and the family's been growing dahlias and breeding them since the 20s. So almost, you know, 90, over 90 years. And I'm talking to one of the grandsons or whatever, and he was telling me, yeah, this took seven years, you know, to develop this and this one, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh man, you need to get some weed growers in here and these guys can crank out a, a new strain in a matter of a month or two. So you need, you need to pick up the pace. And he just shook his head and he said, yeah, whatever. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, there's, uh, I, I don't sense this, uh, what are we going to leave the next generation? You know, 200 cushions. I don't know. Or, or whatever they are. Yeah, well, there's just the idea now that using, you know, sci science, we can, uh, and genetic markers, we could identify within a particular strain or cultivar or varietal what, you know, say for example, that specific marker that's associated with uh, helping with epilepsy, so reducing. Mm -hmm. If we can identify that and we can increase the, you know, the particular cannabinoid that helps with that, um, and we can grow out, you know, 200 different phenotypes and identify within seven days, if it's male, female, what, what percent of that marker it's going, to, it's going to express, then we can really quickly make uh, decisions and, and, and make changes that would have taken a regular grower, you know, generation and cycle and cycle to, to actually know. So that to me is both scary and exciting. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying, and I do agree with you that we like we don't have the same relationship with this plant that we that these uh, you know uh, indigenous cultures that that, that treated it like sacred medicine had, and, and right. the that they did there was I think much more spiritual. And I don't want to just throw that out. It's not. I don't think the cannabis plant is just a chemovar or uh, you know a particular expression of these uh chemicals there, there's more to it than that you know and, and maybe that's just the spiritual side of me thinking no I, I i sorry um no it's it, it's uh look we've had what 82 years of insanity since the 1937 law was passed at the urging of uh, DuPont and other big chemical companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the uh, campaign politically, publicly has been, it's a bomb. It's just, it's, it's uh, unreal. All I'm suggesting is, is that the deal that started in the late eighties with this, you know, there's something magical about my strains better than your strain. I think was to the detriment of the plant itself. And uh, I used to have a tagline on my, when we were before social media, when we were doing forums, you know, once you take the wolf down to a chihuahua, there's no going back. And I kind of think uh, that's a little bit where we're at. Well, no, we're, that's a lot where we're at. It, it, tomatoes, why is it that we want to grow heirlooms? Well, we want flavor and color and, and uh, a robust plant, right? Yeah, we're because, sick of aromas and tomatoes on the vine, as they call it. You know, just the, yeah, the variety yeah. you get in the store. The store, yeah. they have, you know, they last the longest. Well, I, I was in the produce industry for several years, and, and yeah, your biggest concern is what they call legs. From the time we pick it, how long, optimum time to get it into a distribution center, you know. And so uh, you were probably uninterested, hopefully, but in the 90s, 
CalGene was a big project that involved Monsanto at UC Davis, and they were going to create the tomato that had the lo uh, longest shelf life or something by uh, replacing one of the uh, DNA or RNA, whatever, from a, a, using a potato. So it was, they were just stumbling around with, with the genetic modified uh, plants. And um, the publicity against it and the media, it just killed the project. I mean, look up Cal Jean sometime and it was a mess. And it was a harbinger of things to come, I think. <laughs> um, I don't want to eat Franken food. I distrust the people at Monsanto as much as I do law enforcement. You know, I don't need your goodwill. I can figure this out. I know where to get tomatoes seeds. Mm -hmm. I don't need your garbage. And, uh, but the average consumers walking into what's that? There's a, there's a line from a song by, uh, Grace Slick that said, uh, I don't care if my lettuce has DDT on it, as long as it's crisp. Okay. And that's kind of where we're at as a society. Well, yeah, but the tomatoes are so pretty. Well, yeah, you see those lights they put in there that hit, you know, this, the special lighting that gives you that look. And yeah. so, uh, it's Franken food and, all you need to do is go to a mall and look at the level of obesity that has struck our children. I mean, look, diabetes, type two diabetes used to be an old person's disease. That's what you got like in your fifties or sixties from, well, being a dickhead, you know, <laughs> <laughs> drinking too much. You know. <laughs> I, I laugh at that cause I know you're battling it. My dad's battling it. So I think it's, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't make good decisions, you know. I mean, yeah. let's get honest here. But to see children. It's as young as They've locked uh -huh. 20, 25 years off their life expectancy. And, and I think that's just horrible. And, you know, if we treated our dogs like we treat our children, we'd be arrested if you gave a dog a cup of coffee and a, you know, Winchell's donut in the morning for breakfast, somebody would probably come and arrest you for girl eating animals. But yeah, you do it. We put, you know, uh, cook machines in our schools. How are you going to have a thriving human being with all that junk going in their bodies from the time they get up till they go to bed? Oh, and then let's add in the, uh, let's sit in front of and play whatever the latest, you know, computer game is on there or, or, or worse or worse now we'll uh you don't have to walk you can walk around with your phone and play you know, i don't even know the games anymore so you know, <laughs> i don't i don't really care but that's, yeah. that's my um but back well, to back to but fungi i think fungi will bring i yeah, i know it sounds corny to some but i the more i've delved into this over the last two or three years. I agree with Paul Stamets that fungi will be what saves the human race from itself. I, I, that I sincerely believe. And like you're, you just had the experience of eating fresh uh, oysters the other day. That would not be a hard diet to acclimate yourself to. Yeah. I mean, you could say, you know, I could do without meat. If I could have this quality of protein, yeah, I could see moving towards a, a plant. It's not a plant, but you get my idea. A, a non-meat uh, uh, diet. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think it has a really big, important role to play. I, I can know, like, from your own experience, that taking the uh, – taking, but uh, using the uh, oysters – excuse me, the uh, lion's mane and, and whichever ones you choose, mm -hmm. the cordyceps. Like I said, my, my recipe that I get is uh, equal parts by volume or weight. I, I, well, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, reishi, cordyceps, and lion's mane. And I think that's a really nice balance. Okay. Uh, 
I'm not promoting it. Just uh, I'm sure that there are other people offering the same same type of uh, mixes and what have you. And if I get those mushrooms, or when I do get those mushrooms from China, I'll be more than happy to share those spores with you. I even have an electric stir plate, you know, <laughs> for uh, mixing the spores with the uh, honey water and all that stuff for inoculation. And cool, cool. So we we uh, I we emptied our house out. I don't know if you've seen that book about how to oh the Marie Con Marie Kondo book. Yeah. Well, basically, yeah, our, that's what we did. Yeah. We stripped this house clean, furniture, everything gone. Wow. Uh, one was I wanted to do the floors right, and it's a lot less money if they're not having to move <laughs> furniture around, you know. <laughs> yeah. So part of it, so part of it was an economic consideration, but you know, uh, uh, since we've done that, and I haven't bothered to. Uh, Go get a lot of furniture. I got a couple of Nordic uh, recliners. You know. That was pretty cool. So I'm not a minimalist. You know, I'm not sitting here with the uh, Adirondack chairs from Walmart or something. But uh, I just thought, you know, owning a bunch of stuff is really a downer. I don't know. Because uh, yeah. then you got to be, then you're responsible for it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to maintain it and store yeah. it. Yeah. Care yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah yeah it, it tells somebody about it so, oh that's really cool you know yeah. it's like uh i had a friend of mine he was really brilliant in high school and he got a scholarship and went to harvard and then uh about a year after he graduated harvard he began a downward trajectory hmm. alcohol and you know whatever other drugs and I remember one time he said to me, he goes, you know, but people are still really impressed that I went to Harvard. I said, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. So what, uh, you know, write a book or something, I guess, you know, my years at Harvard, uh, I, I, I don't know. This, uh, last year, uh, getting ready to fully retire and, you know, unloading the house payment that was really liberating it's like all i got to do is come up with 300 dollars a month for property t uh, taxes here that's great that's yeah. like i paid more than that when i got out of high school you know rent i mean 300 a month so uh yeah it's pretty cool i mean I don't know. I just, I don't feel a need to, other than toys, you know, I mean, some, uh, there's another camera I want to get. Um, because I know I, I really want to learn just for my own pleasure, I guess, is how to do video editing on the iPad. Yeah. And, uh, there's, and there's some really professional work being done. And I, I'm not saying I'm going to compete with that, but just to see the challenge there of, of mixing, audio tracks and, and with the uh, video that I shoot. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's fun. It's uh, a lot better than I got powder and mildew. What should I do? In your case, I'd take a machete and take it down and hope, you know, for better luck next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing well. And uh, I'm glad we got to talk about mushrooms and, minimalism and uh, cannabis a little bit. And I think it would be really cool as we were doing this, I was just thinking in my head, it'd be cool to come back on and not talk about how to grow uh, psilocybin mushrooms necessarily, but to just talk about some of the effects and usage and um, some of your experiences, I think would be cool to share in a separate interview if you're open to it. Yeah, I, uh, the, the only thing that can really, I mean, you know, my first experience with uh, psilocybin was, let's see, 1968. So that's 51 years ago. Well, uh, I don't want to give it all away, but I would no, like to tag on to no, talk about it. <laughs> no, but no, I just want to say that uh, the microdosing became a really uh, big part of this transition. And well, what I was in your life, huh? recently in your life 
Yeah, I start. Uh, I went to see Paul Stamets give us a uh, talk in September, so about yes. what nine months ago. Yeah. And in fact, that was the one I sent you. That was yeah. from that uh, presentation. And so I thought, hmm, I'm going to have to give this a shot. So I did. And so I started October 1st. And so that's what, eight and a half months now. And the one thing that I can say is that when somebody asked me, well, what did it do for you? And I said, clarity. And that to me was the biggest gift I could have ever been given at this stage of my life. And had such knowledge been out there 10, 20 years ago, I would have, anyway, I'm not, I don't sell things. And so uh, it matters not to me, but I just know that people who are suffering from depression, long-term hardcore depression that, uh, well, my daughter, for example, she died uh, after struggling for 12 years with, uh, she was uh, fine, diagnosed as a, uh, uh, schizophrenic. 12 years, you know, it was a real tragedy. And I just wonder if that could have been helpful. Yeah. And um, if we just get rid of this silly uh, social and political crap about how we treat different situations. One is, for example, end of life. That's a hard thing for anybody to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, you're given a diagnosis, you know, you're going to be, you know, tidy up your affairs. And so research at John Hopkins and other major research have found that uh, administering these psychotropic uh, mushrooms help people make that bridge psychologically so that it isn't just doom. They can put things in perspective. And why wouldn't we want to do that for our, our friends, our parents, or anybody, I mean, why wouldn't we want that available, or at least research it, correctly research, not, I don't know, you wanna to listen to Dead or Jimi Hendrix, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess that if I had a soapbox, that would be it, that we need to change, the, and I'm involved with the group here in Oregon trying to get it on the ballot next year. Uh, not to legalize, not to even decriminalize, just to allow, legitimate research that has been done at Harvard and John Hopkins and universities in Asia and uh, Europe yeah. and what have you. And so if, if we can bring a uh, phrase I like to use, you know, put some adults in charge. Okay. They don't have an agenda trying to promote, you know, ABC mental health services or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, pharmaceuticals. Uh, what, what I used to call it. Uh, oh, uh, stay bombed uh, pharmaceuticals. I always thought it would be a really good name for a cannabis company. So, uh, but uh, in a serious sense, I mean, the way that we're treating our our citizens and our and our, our friends and our family is it's really horrible. Um, I watched my daughter go through every Prozac and I mean, I can't even name them all. Sure. Yeah. And I just saw this downward, you know, watching your child die over 12 years was, uh, well, it's not something that I would want. I would wish on my, I don't have enemies, but I, I would wish on nobody that, uh, you know, we have to do something better. I don't know that I don't I don't have the answers. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't pretend to be. But what I do know is that what we're doing isn't working. And yeah. uh, how is your father? He's good. He's uh, he's semi-retired now. I mean, he's got a whole bunch of projects going on. Uh, but they're out in, 
they're out on the Olympic Peninsula now. They actually had a whale wash up on their beach, a gray whale this last Oh my week. goodness. Wow. Uh, seeing one of those in person was crazy. Um, so we went out there for that. They got to, they were able to move it fortunately because the thing uh, stunk like you would not believe as it started <laughs> composing. Um, or that famous uh, video from the sixties when they blew one up on the Oregon beach. Oh, I heard about that. <laughs> oh God, my God. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it must yeah. have been a slow news day, but uh, yeah, the uh, we we go to Cape Mears uh, for whale watching here in Oregon, and to see them moving north or south, depending on the time of year, or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, They're pretty incredible creatures. I don't yeah. want to take away from that. I mean, I, ideally, it never would have washed up on the beach, but since it did, we took the opportunity to actually get to see it up close. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was. I wanted to add this one. One final thought. Um, you know, the life. I'm not trying to get into uh, anybody's religious beliefs, or whatever. Certainly not that. But if we could agree that life came from the ocean and the form of plants, I think that's what is so remarkable about kelp, kelp meal. Mm -hmm. in its purest form, like the form that you uh, use and I use to pull it out of the ocean, dry it in the sun and chop it up. Yeah. There's so much benefit there, not just the plants. Yeah, I mean, that's a given, you know, for uh, agriculture and horticulture. But uh, taking a capsule a day is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Uh, beneficial and uh the quality that we get uh uh acadian sea plants of uh, material yeah it, it's coming out of clean water cleaner water than i would want to necessarily do the pacific with all the tankers and what have you moving across it but um uh, yeah i started taking kelp uh caps just uh I'd have to reweigh it, but it's probably a little bit more than maybe a, a little bit more than a gram a day. And I saw it because I, when I got this puppy from my good friend, said it, forget it organics. He gave me this bulldog puppy. And so I went to this, uh, we be cool, holistic. I love that term holistic pet center. And they had kelp meal. Yeah. So I'm reading the label. It's the same variety that we use in our soil mixes. And I looked at the price. It was $18 a pound. Because it, it, they ground it finer. I mean, yeah. I can live with it, you know. <laughs> so I started uh, giving her a teaspoon in the morning with her meals and then a teaspoon at night uh, with her meal. And all of the puppies that came out of that same... Uh, litter most of the puppies uh the gift giver to us sees those puppies and he said man without a doubt your dog is the biggest the strongest oh, the healthiest great. and um so talking with a, a rep from asl to trade show one time he said look jim he says you know we love you guys but if People quit using it in their soil. We wouldn't even mention it at a stockholders meeting. You know, you guys are nothing. Uh, which is, you know, true. The majority of kelp is used in biomedicines for human and animals. Yeah. But uh, you want stronger whatever it is. Horses, dogs, livestock, kelp meal. My chiropractor has draft horses he's got like 20 of them I'm talking about a weird hobby i go do you ride them goes, you can't ride draft horses goes, so what do you do with them he goes they're just beautiful to look at wow. so anyway uh we were talking with Dan. yeah and guess what they uh, part of their diet includes rock dust and uh kelp meal huh. i just found that really fascinating so i i uh turned them on to using concentrates because of the selection and quality and price and then I got them off of uh, glacial rock dust and over to basalt. 
and you know he he was really impressed with the changes that he saw in his uh, but anyway so there's more in commonality with plants and animals than we probably want to address or can address yeah you know i think i just find it interesting when i started adding it to my mushroom substrate i went wow this is really cool i mean this is like and I want to get back to you on that uh, question because you asked a really legitimate question that I cannot find a definitive answer. Can we tweak the substrate and increase whatever properties is we're looking for? We want a, a more meat-like flavor, we'll say, in an oyster mushroom. Can we manipulate that with the substrate? Just because you can grow it on newsprint. I'm, I'm sure we can, and we just don't have the research on it yet. No, well, we don't. I'm, I'm positive that it would change the flavors. And I mean, that's, that's what happens with all vegetables. I, I don't see why the pathways with fungus. I, yeah. And so that's uh, something that uh, my friend and I have really been focused on is trying to bring some of the practices that we've been doing for several years in the area of uh, soil mixes which one of those can we bring over here to this and make uh, see a benefit, a viable benefit? Yeah, and I and I think that we we are. Um, but you know, kind of like you already know, I don't want to sell substrate. I mean, sure, I don't want to listen to uh, you know, I just. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, Jim, yeah. I got I to gotta run for today. But All right, thank man. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to talk kelp at some point because I got some stuff I want to share with you. And then uh, I'd love to talk to you about some of these uh, psychedelics and just, okay. just talk, talk right. about experiences and, and, and some of that. So good. we'll do this again soon, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye.